God's desire for your life is that you would make His Word your standard of living. The basis of all truth is God's Holy Word. We invite you to join the Beulah Baptist Church in Bennett, North Carolina for Truth For Today with Dr. Neil Jackson. Dr. Jackson's verse-by-verse preaching will encourage you in your journey of life and answer your greatest questions from God's Word. So open your Bible and your heart to hear truth for today. Unforgettable Lessons from Forgotten People is Dr. Jackson's four-part sermon series on making an eternal impact with your life. You'll be instructed and inspired with the difference a single person can have in our world when they're committed to Christ. For your gift of $40 or more, we'll send you this series, and you'll be partnering with us as we seek to tell the world of God's great love. So when you write or call, make sure you request the series, Unforgettable Lessons from Forgotten People, with your gift of $40 or more. It was one small stone from the sling of a teenager that dropped the giant and saved the nation. It was a handful of barley and some drops of oil that fed the prophet, that fed the widow, and that fed her son. It was a few small loaves and a couple of fish that fed 5,000 men plus the women and their children. It was a small, insignificant nation made up of men who had never fought that conquered the promised land. It was a tiny village in Judah who produced the Messiah that would save the people from their sins. It was a small band of uneducated men, of arrogant men, of self-seeking men that turned the world upside down with the gospel. God has never sought after big-time people, spectacular people, magnificent people. He sought after insignificant people, low people, poor people, forgotten people. Such is the person of this man by the name of Epaphras. 
The world would say he was insignificant. The world would say, hey, he's only mentioned three times in Scripture. This guy is a nobody. He's from Colossae. He would grow up and he would found a church there in his hometown. So he never ventured far. He was just a homeboy who stayed to work with his homies. That was Epaphras. His name means lovely. And he's a lovely guy. And all of us can learn from him today. This man, Pastor Epaphras, traits that distinguished him. And the reason that God used him in a mighty, huge, gigantic, incredible way. Sermon is entitled, Epaphras, the little, insignificant, big guy. First characteristic, first quality I want you to see. Epaphras, the pastor. You're in Colossians chapter 1. Notice verse 7. As ye also learned of Epaphras... Our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Paul always spoke in affectionate terms when he would refer to Epaphras. He says, our dear fellow servant. He's dear to me. He's special to me. I love that Epaphras. He's a fellow servant. Paul numerous times referred to himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. And when he thought of Epaphras, he thought of those same qualities. Hey, he's just a servant. He's just a do-anything-you-asked-him type of guy. He is a fellow servant of Christ. Look on what he says. Who is for you? See the next word. A faithful, a dependable one of the greatest qualities that could ever be said of a pastor is he's faithful. Anybody can come in and shine and make a big splash short term. But who's going to serve the Lord in the bad times? Who's going to serve the Lord when the honeymoon's over? Who's going to put his hand to the plow and not look back in the good times, in the rainy times, in the fruitful times, in the barren times? He was faithful. See what he says? A faithful minister of Christ. It means servant. Epaphras was called just to serve. He was called just to minister. He was called to serve the unlovable, the unlovely. He was called to serve those wonderful church members. He was called to serve those easy to minister to church members. And he was called to serve the difficult church members. He was charged and and called to serve the, the, the challenging church members. He was called to serve those church members that just get under your skin. He was a faithful member. You say, how did this Epaphras, how did he serve? Look up at verse 3. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now notice verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints... Now, Paul hadn't visited Colossae, chapter 2, verse 1, but he had heard of their faith. He had heard of their great love for the other believers. He said, hey, I've heard of your strong faith. I've heard of your great love for the believers. Well, how did they get their faith? How did they get this great love for people? Look at verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. The Colossian believers had accepted Christ when they heard the gospel. Well, how did they hear the gospel? Epaphras. He served his community by preaching, by proclaiming the word. Look at verse 7 again. As ye also learned of Epaphras. Learned there is related to the word disciple. So he not only preached the gospel to them, he discipled them. You say, well, how did this preacher, this pastor Epaphras, how did he disciple these people? Preaching the word. 
week after week, when it was full, when it was empty, when he was starting the church, when nobody was showing up, he would open up his Bible and he would say, this is what God has to say. You understand the most important job of the pastor is not having a good personality. The most important job of the pastor is not visiting the sick. He should. The most important job of the pastor is not doing the funerals and doing the weddings. The most important job of the pastor is preaching the word. You say, preacher, is that your opinion? Where do you get off on saying that? 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Notice what the last part of the phrase says especially they who labor. That word labor means to feel fatigued. It describes a, 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 someone who has work and it's just worn out. The pastor, the elder, is worthy of double honor, especially those, see what it says, who labor in the word and doctrine. The church that has a pastor who labors and who is tireless and studies and studies and studies and studies and studies is blessed. This pastor Epaphras was a model pastor. He was a faithful pastor. He was a diligent pastor. He preached and proclaimed the word and it brought forth much fruit. You say, where do you see that? Look at verse 6. Which is... Come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. The word will not return void. So when it is preached, when it is proclaimed, when it is taught, when it is given forth constantly over and over and over, it brings forth fruit. That's what Epaphras did. He saw his church grow because he made much of Scripture. Epaphras, the pastor. Secondly, I want you to notice. Epaphras, the prayer warrior. Now, Paul knew that Epaphras was a prayer warrior. We don't know if they were in the prison cell together and he observed his prayer life, but we don't know how he found out, but he knew, he testified, hey, oh, Paphras, he is a faithful pastor who preaches the word. Oh, Epaphras is a man of prayer. Epaphras is diligent in prayer. Paul was a writer. Epaphras We can't find that he wrote anything. Paul received much revelation from God. We don't find recorded that Epaphras ever did. But you know what he did? This insignificant guy that's barely mentioned in the Bible got a hold of God and he prayed. He was diligent in his prayers. You're in chapter 4. Look at verse 12. Epaphras who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Notice the next word. Always. Prayer was not an occasional matter. He prayed constantly. You're in chapter 4. Look up at verse 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with all thanksgiving. Epaphras was a good example of Paul's admonition. He prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And he prayed and he prayed. Always when he was driving down the road in his chariot, he was praying with his eyes open. He prayed all the time when he was walking in the way, when he was lying down, when he was sitting down. He had a constant communication with God in prayer. He was diligent. He prayed always. Friend, how is your prayer life? Listen, listen, listen. you don't have to sing a solo to have a prayer life. You don't have to teach Sunday school to have a prayer life. How is your prayer life? You say, preacher, I'm a nobody. Preacher, I'm insignificant. Preacher, I'm not one of these public people. You don't have to be, but friend, you in your little quiet place can change the world through prayer. Epaphras did. He was diligent in his prayers. Look on in verse 12. He was devoted in his prayers. Saluteth you always 
laboring fervently for you in prayers. Laboring fervently, it means to agonize. It means working to the point of exhaustion. Same Greek word was used in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. Of an athlete running a race, he would strive, he would push, he would strive. Same exact word is used in John chapter 18, verse 36. It was translated to fight. This person would fight as best as he can. He would give his entire self to fighting. That's what you and I are to do in prayer. Friend, 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 our world's in a mess. We have people all around us that are struggling, and we as Christians are doing nothing about it. We have the capability. We have the resources in prayer. But we don't pray. Oh, I don't pray like I should. But friend, let's be honest. You don't pray like you should. Listen, listen, listen. Our world, our community, our church could be radically changed if some of us would start praying. If some of us would get diligent and say, you know what, we're going to pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray. We're going to cut the television off and we're just going to seek God. We are going to come men and women who pray. Look at verse 13. For I bear him record that he hath Great zeal for you. Zeal means heat or hot. He hath great zeal for you that are in Laodicea and in Heropolis. Epaphras himself prayed. He had a heart for his community. He got worked up. He would break out in sweats. He was zealous in prayer. Friend, my question to you. How is your prayer life? What do you get fired up about? What do you get excited about? What moves you? It should be the souls of men and women lost and saved that need Jesus. Hey, how is your prayer life? You say, preacher, I'm a nobody. I can't do all those things. Friend, you, if you're a follower of Christ, you can pray. You can seek God's face. You can go in your closet and change the world. You, an insignificant person. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That is true. And if that is true, the inverse is also true. The cold, complacent prayer of an unrighteous man availeth little. How is your prayer life? How is your communion with God? There are needs right now in your life that will only be met through prayer. There are needs in our church life that will only be met if we as a church pray. There are needs in our world that will go on and get worse Unless people raise their hand and say, hey, I'm a nobody. Hey, I'm insignificant. You know what? I'm not good at a lot of things, but I'm going to get a hold of God and get him to work on our behalf. I'm going to pray. This insignificant little guy was a big guy in prayer. He was diligent. He was devoted. Thirdly, he was determined. Look, look, look back at verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always laboring fervently for you. He was specifically, he was praying for those individuals in his life. Oh, God, he was calling out by name. God, you got to protect them. God, you got to put your hand upon them. God, show them great and mighty things that they don't know. He was praying for his church, his community specifically for you. Look on, look on, look on. In prayers, now notice this. That ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. That was his job. 
His job, we saw in chapter 1, he was successful at his job, was to grow these people up in their faith and cause them to love people. He was successful in his job because he prayed about it. Listen, listen, friend, God doesn't want you meeting all of your needs. God wants to meet all of your needs. That's why, hey, if you're working in the meal, pray about it. That, hey, if you're working in the school, pray about it. Hey, if you're working outside doing construction, pray about it. God will put his hand and use you at the meal. At that, the construction site, God will use you in the classroom. He prayed about it. He was praying all the time, and God used him. Notice what it says. For you in prayers, that you may be perfect and complete, mature, fully developed. One other thought. You see right there in the middle of that verse, he was praying for you in prayers. If we're honest... A lot of our prayers are me focused. God, give me this. God, take away that. God, give me, give me, give me, give me. Oh, God, I don't like that person. Zap him. God, do this, do this, do this. God, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Oh, God, and give me this. That is our prayer life. Epaphras. I'm sure he prayed for his needs, but he was praying for other people. That is intercession. God, you work mightily in the midst of those around me. He was praying for others. Who are you praying for? Friend, friend, friend. Who in your life is in need of prayer? And what are you doing about it? God put you there to change their life. You say, preacher, I'm a nobody. I can't change this person's life. You don't know their needs, friend. You can change their life through prayer. Calling out to God, God, this person you placed in my sphere of influence, and I'm asking you to come and show yourself strong on their behalf. Epaphras, the pastor. Epaphras, The prayer warrior, thirdly, turn over to Philemon, verse 23 says, there salute the Epaphras, you know what it says, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. So Paul's already said, hey, he's a fellow servant, he just serves, 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 serves. Here he's called a fellow prisoner, he wasn't a fair weather Christian. When it was easy to serve Jesus, he served Jesus. When it was difficult to serve Jesus, he served Jesus. We don't know where he was in prison. We don't know how long he was in prison. We know he wasn't in prison for for stealing cars or cheating on his taxes. He was in prison for preaching the gospel faithfully. Historians tell us he was the first bishop of Colossae to be martyred for his faith to be killed, to be executed. We don't know how long he stayed in prison, but it did not diminish his his resolve to serve the Lord. It did not diminish his commitment to sacrifice for Jesus. He was persecuted. The word sacrifice. What does that mean to you? The word sacrifice, Webster defines it as the surrender of something valuable or prized. Who do you sacrifice for? What do you sacrifice? And who do you sacrifice it for? You say, well, I sacrifice for my children. They are my flesh and blood and I sacrifice for them. And you should. You think about those fathers going off to work, laboring hard to feed and clothe their children. You sacrifice for them. You think of those mothers and how they labor. They're up early. They're getting them dressed. They're getting them fed. They're doing all of these things. They're ironing their clothes. They sacrifice for their kids. That's great. Say, well, I sacrifice for my spouse. And you should. You think of of these husbands that sacrifice for their wife, 
Tracy is in Louisiana this week, and she's been gone for several days. And David and I really miss her because we didn't realize she sacrifices a lot. And this, this food, it didn't just come out of nowhere. Somebody had to do something, sacrifice. Say, so, well, sacrifice for my job. Man, I work long and hard. I'm diligent. I'm faithful. I work and I sacrifice. When I'm called upon, I sacrifice. I give up my time. I give up my talents. I give up my energy for my job. That is great. You should. Friend, how much do you sacrifice for God? How much do you sacrifice for your community? How much do you sacrifice for your enemies. You say, hey, you see all those other, my, my, my children, they're my flesh and blood. My spouse, well, I made a vow to her. My job, well, they pay me. My enemies, they don't do anything good for me. And, and, and my community, I don't know about that. Friend, the way insignificant people are used mightily is sacrifice. Sacrifice for God. Sacrifice for the ungodly. Giving your life, giving your time, giving your talent, giving your treasure for a cause bigger than yourself. Listen, I'm done. The greatest example of sacrifice we'll ever see is Jesus. Jesus gave his time Jesus gave his talent. Jesus gave up all of his rewards and and all of his earthly possession in heaven to come to earth to die on a cross for you. And that is our model. We are to, oh God, we thank you for your sacrifice. And we are going to be people that sacrifice for others. So the invitation today is this. Will you surrender to God to sacrifice? God, I don't know what you want, but everything I have, I open up my hands and I say it's yours. God, if you want my money, I'll give it to you. God, if you send somebody across my path and you tell me to reach out to them, you're controlling my calendar. God, I'm making a commitment today at you are to sacrifice. Thank you for joining us this week for Truth For Today. Our prayer is that God's Word has ministered to your deepest need and answered many of your questions about life. Truth For Today is only able to stay on the air through the financial support of God's people. Would you consider partnering with us to take the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world? You may mail your gifts to Truth For Today, P.O. Box 104, Bennett, North Carolina, 27208. Please include the call letters of this station when you write. If you'd like to receive a copy of today's message, please request this sermon with your donation of any amount. If you'd like to donate by credit card, you may call 336-581-3170. Be assured that God's Word has the answer for your every need. And join us next week for Truth For Today. 